we can start, right? Right, go ahead. Okay, so hi, uh, hello, and welcome everyone to Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. I am Akanksha Singh, I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And let me give you a brief introduction of our organization. We are tired of the same people talking about the same thing and expecting change. So we set up Be Waste Wise. It is a nonprofit organization to grow around the principles of dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since 2013. Dialogue is different from the bite sides information. It is the opposite of one way dissemination. It is the process in which people join with the intent to learn and exchange facts, perspectives, and wisdom. Diversity, on the other hand, means actively looking for new groups of people and new ways of knowing and thinking in order to learn more about the world. Be Waste Wise started with one moderator in 2013, and now we have more than 12 till last year, and we are among the best at what they do and come from different parts of our world and society. Together, they are posing questions, teasing out insights, and guiding conversations that are more relevant to us than those in other online and offline places. Uh, more than 300 cont contributors have also taken part in this journey. One such eminent and learned moderator we have with us is Emma Burlow. Emma is the founder of Lighthouse Sustainability, and she's one of UK's leading specialists on circular economy and sustainability in businesses. She's worked with businesses on sustainability for more than 25 years, and she has excellent overview of how to manage large scale projects alongside the detail of what drives individual businesses and ultimately sustainability outcomes. Emma has been moderating Be Waste Wise webinars for many years together now, and today she is going to talk to two very learned experts from the industry, Jerry O'Brien, a wildlife advocate, and Susan Jonas Slabbert, the head of sustainability at Asia Pacific Rim. Today's webinar's discussion is on managing waste for conversation and livelihood, where our learned panel will talk about how we can take a more holistic approach to dealing with waste, such as building local programs that are part of uh, regional trash management plans and set up garbage collection and sorting programs that put people to work and help them in their local economies. Before we proceed to the discussion, I would request you all to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and YouTube channel. Please use the Q&A function for your questions to the panel, and we would request you all to please introduce yourself in the chat function, where you're from, and what you've been up to, what is your profile, and if you have any comment for the panel, please use this uh, chat function. So uh, back to the topic, how we can manage garbage holistically. Emma, over to you. Thanks ever so much, Akanksha. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, so pleased to be here. And uh, yeah, thanks again. What a great organisation Be, Be Waste Wise is and bringing some brilliant people together. Um, so I'm going to get started by just welcoming uh, everyone coming in. I don't think I've ever done a webinar with people from so many different countries. So uh, welcome to those from uh, Trinidad and Tobago, from the States, from France, from Ireland. You can see for yourself St. Lucia coming on in. Um, and uh, yeah, I really hope that you'll make connections between yourselves as well as us today. So do drop in your LinkedIn profile or your preferred social media profile. Um, let's get some conversations happening outside of this room as well. So my guests, um, really, really uh, happy to welcome Jerry and Susan here today. Um, it's uh, afternoon where Jerry and I are in the UK and it's in the evening where Susan is in Indonesia. Um, Jerry, could you just kick us off giving us a quick um, introduction to, to what you do, please? Yes, of course. Thanks, Emma. Uh, so my name is Jerry. I'm a forest ranger based in the Forest of Dean, which is in the beautiful Wye Valley on the English-Welsh border. So I'm from Ireland originally, grew up in the countryside, spent my childhood outdoors, lots of nature connections. Uh, always loved it. And I guess as I got a bit older, like many of us, into my teenage years and early adulthood, you know, I became a soldier, I was in the military, I had lots of adventures, but that kind of nature connection maybe was stinted for a little while. And when I left the military in my mid-twenties, I took off traveling around the world, a lot of time in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, a little bit in the States. And I had some incredible wildlife encounters, which really, I think, reawakened my wildlife passion and also uh, opened my eyes to the incredible diversity of life on this planet. So I came back with a mission, you know, to protect wildlife, to do what I could. So I trained as a forest ranger 
I got my degree. I've been 15 years forest ranger now and wildlife advocate and ecotherapist as well. Fantastic, Jerry. That's great. And welcome to this forum because I've been in sustainability and business for 25, nearly 30 years, and I've never had a forest ranger on a panel or seen at an event, you know, and that's really what this is about. It's bringing different worlds together to start this conversation. So thank you for joining us, Jerry. Uh, and hopefully many more to come. Susan, would you be able to give us a quick introduction, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Emma. And thank you to the Be Wise Wise uh, team also for um, inviting us to be part of this discussion. So um, even though I'm in my personal capacity also a, a big advocate for wildlife, uh, you know, restoration, conservation, um, I think I bring a bit of a different perspective uh, to the table today. So I specifically work in sustainability um, in the viscose production um, uh, industry at the moment. And I've come from manufacturing my entire career. So definitely a different perspective. And I hope to bring to the conversation a little bit of um, nuance on how we look at impact and you know, primary drivers that impact biodiversity from a manufacturer's perspective, specifically in the global south. Um, so yeah, um, happy to be part of this uh, discussion and I hope we can have a, a good interaction and, mm. and uh, help each other understand some of these challenges we face. Great, brilliant. I want to bring these two worlds together. So let's let's get going. I think we were going to start with a poll. Um, Akanksha, if you're there, are you able to pop the poll up for us? Sure. Thanks very much. And people still coming in as we get as we get straight into this poll. So um, what do people think, the people joining us now? Do you believe business is taking the biodiversity crisis seriously? Wow, we've gone straight in there with some no's. A couple of yeses, do we need, we, it is happening, but it needs more effort. Education, 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 as somebody famous once said. Keep going, if you can interact with that, that'd be great. 30 people so far. Welcome to Catherine from St. Pete Beach in Florida. Wow. Okay. Okay, 33. Anybody else want to in interact with the poll? What do you think? Great. Some people see lots of action. If you are that person, can you tell us about it during the next hour? I'd love to hear the action that you're seeing. We need to share it, definitely. Okay, a couple of minutes. Okay, what I'm seeing from that is nearly half of people or over half of people actually, 44 and 19% collectively saying no, they don't think that business is taking biodiversity crisis seriously. And a good, you know, a good um, number of people actually out of the poll saying, yes, there is work going on. Um, let's start with that. Uh, Jerry, you're a wildlife advocate. Do you think business is taking it seriously? Um, probably not seriously enough. Don just put in the chat that uh, a lot of businesses want to do the right thing. None of us want to destroy the environment or eradicate species, but uh, as Don's alluded to, a lot of places just don't know where to start. So education is key and we need wildlife advocates, um, sustainability advocates, maybe getting into business. I would urge every business to have to actually directly employ people in those lines. But I guess, you know, especially on the back of the pandemic, it comes down to finances, money, but that's where all of us can influence our bosses. At even at small scale level, it can ripple out and maybe uh, start letting businesses realize the benefits of working towards biodiversity and sustainability targets. Mm, so what I'm hearing there is we need to hear more, or we need to be educated more by the people who know. Right. We might know how to feed the birds in our garden or identify a few trees on a walk, but we're not experts. We certainly don't know about the biodiversity crisis. So before I come on to you, Susan, I'm just going to ask Jerry, in your words, how would you describe the biodiversity crisis to a business? 
Well, it's well, a tricky well, one to like launch in with, isn't it? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, biodiversity, <laughs> in a nutshell, it's it's the very fabric of life. It makes our existence on this planet possible. Um, obviously, it creates healthy soil for our food crops, provides clean water for drinking, and a diverse range of nutrients for us. So, without a biodiverse environment, we just can't function. We can't survive. So, it, it kind of staggers me that there is not more maybe not panic, but more awareness, more important stress upon conserving biodiversity. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that analogy. I think uh, Paul Utrecht came up with it in the 1990s. It was about an aeroplane. He said, if you can imagine an aeroplane as the all the species on the planet are a part of that aeroplane. So if an in, in, individual rivet falls off, you might go, oh, that's, that doesn't really affect me. Some species far away has died out, but the more pieces fall away from that plane, eventually it's going to crash and burn. So analogy, if, yeah. if tangles of those complex ecosystems start to unravel, um, yeah, it can go downhill pretty fast. We pass those, you know, certain uh, sticking points where we just have no comeback from. So okay. I, I don't know. I've learned over time, though, if you go in with the kind of uh, panic kind of, mode to businesses they don't really engage or react i think you have to almost take a step back a little bit and talk to them from a more kind of a measured perspective where you say by uh, managing your waste sustainably we can you know save you money and um, perhaps we can get you some positive pr if we do some local community campaigns that benefit wildlife and i find that's a better way to get your foot in the door and then start to implement change from within Brilliant. Great. Well, that leads me brilliantly on to Susan. So you're in industry, Susan, big, big multinational business. You know, two things I think, are we doing enough was the question in the poll. And then maybe you could tell us how you describe the biodiversity crisis in the business or the industry you're working in. Yeah, so I think crisis already gives the a very clear idea of exactly where we are. Um, and it, I would say in a lot of um, respect it's maybe already a bit too late for us to only start doing something now um, but we should definitely um, continue I've seen I've seen corporate companies do a lot and then I've also seen corporate com um, com companies do as little as possible um, so I think uh, already I also want to refer to what Don earlier said is I think a lot of them have the very good intentions um to do but where to start and i think that's where partnerships and collaboration actually also play quite a critical role and just thinking from a manufacturer's perspective it always starts with implementing circular economy within our operational facilities because we do actually um, require a lot of natural resources to be able to operate our facility our raw materials are coming from plantations and and forests without biodiversity in forest ecosystems and plantation ecosystems, we won't have trees to make dissolving bulb to make viscose. Um, so we need to be very aware of the whole ecosystem because it will impact us in, in multiple ways. So no one will have the answers themselves. So that's why you go out to experts. You mentioned it, you, you cannot do it by yourself. So we usually go out to the industry and say, who's got technology? Maybe there's none available yet, but how can we potentially then come up with solutions um, for the issues that we know we have? And then building circularity, looking at design, the end of use, there's so many things that we need to actually look at. And then when you go to companies or businesses and you um, try and relate this crisis to them, you need to demonstrate how they can see the value within waste. All wastes can have value, either buying by being reused or recycled, repurposed. There's so many things you can do if you break it down into smaller pieces. There's nutrients in some ways. So I think there's really small volumes that is absolutely unsalvageable that needs to be landfilled in the end. And it actually all comes back to making better choices. But bigger companies, they usually sit up and listen when you tell them, I'm going to save you money by turning your waste into value. Um, and then usually they would say, don't bring me the the problems also bring me the solution. So obviously you need to be able to offer them some ideas and then partners who can help them. 
Great, good. Uh, that's so interesting. And immediately we're bringing in this, um, you know, cash is king argument. Uh, arguably, that's kind of where, you know, what's got us in this, this mess, I guess. Um, and so we need to start to bridge this gap between, as you were saying, Susan, we can't actually operate without biodiversity. Love the analogy Jerry used, you know, the aeroplane with the rivets falling off. Well, that is industry, isn't it? You know, that is, you know, we're taking this this resource for granted. So let's bring it back to waste now, um, because I find this tricky. Personally, coming from a waste and circular economy background, you know, what is the relationship between waste and biodiversity? Um, Susan, I'm going to come to you because I know you're in Indonesia. We were talking earlier about the lack of waste infrastructure in in you know the country where you live how do you start to link that to biodiversity yeah i think um okay let me let me first describe uh, from within our boundaries in our manufacturing operations so i think when we look at waste and how it can potentially impact biodiversity and the livelihoods of the people in, within our immediate vicinity say 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers we think of it a little bit different um, we think of whatever we are emitting from our operations or essentially sending out via waste waters um, back to river systems. How can that impact river eco um, ecology? Um, other people also depend on the river system for their livelihoods, whether they water their crops or they, they abstract it for utilization. So we need to be very careful and make sure that whatever we do, we do responsibly because that can have a massive impact. The same with emissions. I think not a lot of people, when they think of waste, we think of an industrial complex that's potentially sending um, gases into the atmosphere. That gets captured in clouds and it can rain acid rain somewhere else. So you really have to make sure that whatever you utilize and send out in terms of waste, that needs to be managed quite critically. So a big responsibility on, on manufacturers. And then, you know, while Countries like Indonesia, they govern industries like us quite strictly. So there's a lot of regulations that very similar to the North American regulations when it comes to waste and waste management. We do find that in some of the more rural areas, uh, specifically where I'm based here in Sumatra, where the local um, people do not have the infrastructure set up like for waste collection. So it, it's quite difficult. We can have some influence in our immediate communities and help with waste collection and sorting and recycling, but not a lot of people have access to, to proper infrastructure. So the only thing they can do is burn their little bit of household waste in, the, in their backyard every day to get rid of it. That in itself has a massive impact on soil pollution. You know, it rains almost every day in Indonesia. So once they've burned the plastics and all the other stuff, it will wash into some water system, some waterway somewhere, again, an impact on, on water. And you can imagine having to burn, you know, your, your empty tins and your plastics in your backyard, the fumes that is being emitted from that as well. So I, now we need to move beyond just our boundaries and saying, okay, we are being responsible um, in our complex and maybe within 50 kilometers from our operations. What happens once you move beyond those boundaries? And that's where we need other industries, government, academics, multiple, so they call it the quadruple helix. We need all people to come and help and um, see how we can help each other come up with solutions to, to conserve better and to protect the loss of, of ecosystems. Great, yeah. So uh, I, that, it's a really good um, examples or, or bringing, you know, waste isn't just the waste we maybe think of in our bin. It's the it's the gases. It's the you know what ends up in the watercourses. It's actually you know true to ecosystems. It's it's much broader maybe than what we think of when we just think of a bottle or a can or whatever. From your side, Jerry, how do you make the connection between waste? I, mean, I, I often think people just think about litter in the environment and and that's it. How do we get people to think more broadly, as Susan was saying? Yeah, it's a complex subject, obviously, but the more wasteful we are, the more impact we're having on the natural world. We're stripping it bare, you know, of all its resources. We're mining deep for, you know, um, special minerals that we put in our phones and computers and 
For me, one of my big bugbears is food waste. One third of the land mass on the planet is used for food production. We've got an 8 billion plus uh, population now on the planet and still rising. So obviously we have to feed everyone. We don't, we don't want people to uh, be malnourished, but, but there's so much food waste, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, Western Europe, and I guess North America region, you know, and we waste so much food that could be used for biofuel. So if we get the systems in place that make that a lot easier for people, um, I, I guess then we're less wasteful in terms of how much of the planet we're taking up to grow more food. You know, we're, we're managing it in a more sustainable manner. It is circular and it does impact wildlife, of course, because the biggest causes of biodiversity decline are one, habitat destruction, two, habitat fragmentation. You know, um, so populations getting isolated, that dilutes their genetic diversity. It stops them from breeding. Uh, you'll have conflict in certain countries where animals are coming onto the, where the crops are being grown. So... Yeah, we just need to think, I think there needs to be a lot of energy and time invested into food production, food mm. waste, all this conversation I think needs to develop. Um, and at a small scale level, we can impact, we can balance that. I work in the forest, but for a, a tourist operator within the forest, and even here at my company, our food waste is, is quite high. You know, it, it, I shudder every time I see it. And we just... That's not, again, true intent. You know, I think if the systems are in place, people will follow them correctly. Uh, I was just saying to the panel before we opened the room, I've just come back from Slovenia, which is a beautiful country, not an ounce of litter anywhere, so clean, so pristine. And even in the small local villages, they've got food waste facilities where people can, can come and put their food waste and that gets taken away for biofuel use. So, um, yeah, that would, that would help. I think so the more conservative we are the more sustainable we are in our food production and yeah other production levels too that we're less impactful on the planet we're we're impacting wildlife and biodiversity a lot less less pollution in the rivers for example and and you know i'm just think letting all that sink in and i'm thinking well this, you know this is amazing and both a huge opportunity at the moment as, as well because we haven't even mentioned the word carbon OK, or climate change. But all of those things that we're doing or suggesting need to be done all help us on the path towards uh, net zero or reducing the impacts of climate change as well. So there's to me seems like lots of win wins here. You know, if you in improve food waste or reduce food waste, you know, you reduce the land mass you need to farm, you reduce cost, you, uh, you know, improve livelihoods, you reduce emissions I mean it's just so much to it it's almost like a, why wouldn't you do that so exactly. there, there's a big shift needed go on Jerry no I was just saying exactly it's all interlinked yeah. isn't it? it's all interlinked you know we're benefiting not just wildlife by doing that but people um yeah everything you know it's all interlinked it's like a I guess a pieces of a jigsaw all coming together mm. Yeah, so it strikes me, and climate's the same, isn't it? When you, you know, when you start to look into it, it's a lot of pieces and a lot of um, complexity. Um, I'm just going to come on to then what a lot of people in the poll said we need more education. So where would you say our main knowledge gaps are? You know, it's very it's easy to say we just need more education, right? But we're short of time. We need to, you know move quickly but also we know businesses don't cope well with you know big generic kind of do everything all at once arguments so where are the main data gaps for you Susan working in industry do you find it hard to get information on the, on these topics well I think in general yes um because it's almost waste is dirty no one wants to talk about the dirty stuff in public so people right. tend to especially in our industry they try and hide the real numbers um and i've often spoken to people and said we need to talk about this more we should be more transparent and open as to our real impacts and then a lot of people would say not everyone is interested in reading and learning about waste but i think we should change that and speak about the dirty stuff more because that's what actually has an impact. You touched on carbon. I think that's the kind of, it's the word of the moment. Everyone is talking about decarbonization, carbon reduction. How do we get people to talk about waste and waste management in the same mm. sense? 
in the, yeah. same, in the same urgency um, because they go hand in hand. If you reduce waste to landfill, there's less methane emissions that reduces carbon emissions. Consumer behavior is critical. Um, people need to know when they buy clothing or when they buy food, how is that going to end up end of life? If you do an LCA um, or you do a proper greenhouse gas inventory and you look at scope three emissions, you'll see that the end of life of a product usually has the biggest impact. Um, because whether it's incinerated or it ends up in a landfill, it's going to have a massive impact. So we need to kind of change the way we as people um, look at this. Um, mm -hmm. if, if each and every one of us just change one small behavior, um, then it will have a big impact. Plastic pollution in Indonesia is insane. Um, and I don't know how we're going to change it because they even wrap individual apples in a plastic cling film and then put that individually wrapped apple in another plastic bag with a plastic tag and that's how it's sold because that's how the consumers want it they want each individual want to have its own little packaging a little sweet that you would buy just as a sucker in a big packet in small packets how do we how do we change that and this, uh -huh. is, this is a massive economy and it's a massive um you know, population of people, how do we change their behavior to say to the producers, um, stop individually packaging these little sweets, just throw all of them into one packet and you already have a reduction, but how do we do that? You need the mm. masses to lead the conversation and for us to be able to have that drive, we need to educate them. And maybe we need to go and start more from primary schools. We've had a lot of success in our industry going to schools, having the children actually educate the parents. Maybe that's where we need to do. We need to, through comics, and especially here in, in Indonesia, the Asian, uh, or no, Korean um, pop culture has got a massive influence here on oh, the youngsters. Maybe yeah. we should get some of these, these celebrities. Influencers, um, yeah, exactly. yeah. So there's some brilliant questions coming through. So that leads me on to that nicely, Susan, actually. There's a couple in here for you. Uh, Abdullah is talking about the schools and in the community, uh, engaging students through a program of green schools. Maybe this is something that businesses can get behind. You know, uh, Jerry was talking about adv being an advocate. How do you be an advocate for these sorts of things? Um, and also somebody else, they haven't given their name, but they are saying that um, they don't like the way that um, academia and nonprofits in the US and Europe are pointing fingers at the Philippines and Indonesia among the, as being the top emitters of plastic waste. So you're saying that the, you know, the plastic waste issue is insane where you live. Maybe it's insane where we live, but we just don't see it. You know, it's all taken away in a black bag. Um, does that make it any better, any worse? Um, but, you know, this is about uh, us having these conversations. I'm just coming on now to, you know, how do businesses start having those conversations? Because we've been quite removed from it, both from nature and probably from education. So Susan, are you seeing that across the industry? Are you seeing any good practice where industry are starting to kind of advocate for these things? Yeah, I have to say, um, since we, we fall within the, the textiles and fashion industry, and I think all of you would be aware that a lot of the fashion brands and and other stakeholders like Textile Exchange, Sustainable Apparel Coalition, all of them are kind of the driving forces behind all of the knowledge that we have in our industry. And I think just as little as 10 years ago, um, we were a lot poorer in terms of knowledge on the impact of our industry and you know, what it means for the rest of the world. Um, and because the right people are started asking the right questions, started putting pressure on the whole value chain, things started right. changing. So now you have this demand from your far downstream customers actually saying, we will no longer purchase from anyone in our value chain if you do not conform. Um, and it was slow roll out, but now we are sitting in the forefront of it being um, enforced. And I think this can be done in any um, industry, but we actually spoke about it a little bit earlier. A lot of these initiatives are being driven by the European Union, um, United Kingdom, North America. It's yet to reach right. Southeast Asia or the production countries because let's face it, a lot of the stuff that's being consumed in the in the EU, UK, and North America is produced here. Mm. So we need the people that's 
kind of driving the consumption on the global north side to be aware of the impact that they are kind of having on the global sure, south. Sure. So, mm -hmm. and, and the, there's great ideas that's coming forth and say, oh, you need to recycle and you need to do this and you need to do that. If you don't have infrastructure in the production production countries, they they will still have an impact. We don't have the infrastructure yet. So maybe these consumer countries need to help develop infrastructure in producer countries so that the whole world and the whole industry can actually benefit. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's all about taking responsibility. That's all about opening your eyes. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think in a way, carbon and the way we measure carbon is maybe helping that because we're having to look at scope three. So, you know, finally working with companies to say, oh, you know, that supply chain, that's part of your problem now. And I know that is starting to open eyes, whether that will help um, necessarily on the biodiversity. But I say, you know, if we can reduce emissions, then we're, we're, we're helping all around. And obviously we're seeing an increase, I think, in awareness of the importance of forests um, and less so, but come, it's coming, the importance of the oceans, because obviously we haven't touched on that. But yeah, the importance of the oceans way. in terms of biodiversity. Um, I'm just going to pick up on another thread because it's starting to come through about mindset change. OK, so Mamta says conservation needs. Oh, it just appears. Con conservation needs an empathetic mindset. So I'm going to come to you, Jerry, with this. Um, and, you know, mindset. Michael says my, uh, mindset change is key to waste management. We need to understand the dangers um, and also understand the value of managing waste slash biodiversity. Jerry, you uh, you work with people all, all the time, taking them out into nature. Is this about empathy or is that too emotional for businesses? H how do we start to join those dots together? Yeah, it's, it's not straightforward, but it's doable. Um, Susan touched on it earlier on, there is a massive disconnect from nature with lots of people. And it's not that we don't care, maybe just people aren't having as many connection experiences. We live in a very digital world. They're not getting as much exposure to nature as say our parents or grandparents would have had, who are much more in tune with the changing of the seasons and the natural cycles. So I think for me, the big thing is, is connecting people with nature again so that's what I'm very passionate about now and I had a game changer moment about four years ago I trained as a forest bathing practitioner so that's Shinrin Yoku a Japanese practice and in Japan employers recognized that when they gave their employees mindful time outdoors not only were they happier and healthier they were also much more productive so spending time wow. outdoors so it was win-win for everyone so when people feel more connected to nature they're going to want to save it and then they're going to look at things like being more sustainable being less wasteful because they can see the impact it's having on the natural world so i think that's a key moment so talking to businesses about this is hard but again you can approach them and in the uk especially at the moment i'm, I'm not sure globally but there's massive conversations around mental health and how nature is uh, can help you know our, our mindset and our physical and emotional well-being so I think if employ, employers would be quite open to discussions about getting employees out for a little nature, a mindful meander or a nature walk once a week, you know, that's, that's the way you could broach it with them and say, this is good for your employees' mental well-being. It will increase productivity. It will mean employees are happier and healthier. So it ticks a lot of boxes. And through people slowing down a little bit and spending mm. more time with nature, they're feeling much more connected to that environment around them um i've always been an outdoors person i've always been a wildlife and nature person but i was oft also kind of a one of these people that was a mile a minute so i've learned to slow down now and i don't always have to trek all over the forest i might just go 500 meters that way and sit by a tree for an hour and sometimes i see more but you feel that deep deep sense of connection and here's the thing time in nature it uh, releases dopamine, endorphin, serotonin, oxytocin. These are all feel-good hormones that are naturally emitted in your brain when you spend mindful time outdoors. So it's win-win, you know. I think um, wow. we can all become advocates for that, the healing power of nature. I think we're only touching the surface level of it. Mm. 
there's a lot I was going to ask you what skills businesses need but actually I think you've touched on something amazing there in that maybe we've been coming at this too much from the kind of data side Mm. um you know how much waste is going in the oceans and how many this and how many that and and people are kind of like you know, what can I do about it? <laughs> but what you've touched on there, Jerry, and again, I think there are really interesting parallels with climate change here because I train people in carbon literacy all the time and they say, you know, I can't do anything about it. It's just my life, you know, whatever I do won't make a difference. But what you're saying is actually slowing down and getting people to realise um, that they are connected can have quite a profound influence on people have you seen that with anybody that you've taken into the forest from that has a business background have you seen any yeah 100 percent. so I, I lead weekly forest bathing workshops and uh <laughs> not to kind of be too uh what's the word you know not to label people too much but no. sometimes you'll get the ladies who turn up who are quite open to it and you might get her husband who's been dragged along and he's a bit like Ugh, right. hesitant i don't want to do this hippie stuff they're often the ones who have the most profound experiences. And I've had, I've brought corporate groups down into the woods and just getting into sit mm. quietly in the forest. I get them to connect with a tree. We do a little meditation wow. and connect with the elements. It's really powerful, actually, very profound. And I mean, I'm an ex soldier. If my old army pal saw me hugging trees and walking barefoot through the woods, I'd get lots of ribbing. But I've gone beyond that now. Science backs this up. And here's a fascinating fact. So I mentioned some of those feel good hormones earlier yeah. on. Oxytocin, it's our feel good hormone. So when you hug somebody, it's our sense of connection. When you hug someone, shake someone's hand, if a mom is breastfeeding her newborn baby, oxytocin has been released in the brain from mom and child. When we sniff the soil, the soil is one of the, the most potent antidepressants there is. Oxytocin is released in our brain when we sniff soil. So basically, mother, wow. earth, you know, it's the nourishment it's providing for us. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm. I feel like I'm. I'm a nature lover. I feel fairly connected. But now I can. I can. I feel like I'm miles away from where I need to be. You know, connected to nature. Um, and I think you know what pops into my head there is we've replaced that with consumerism. Yeah. So going back to Susan's point about you know the consumer wants the apple wrapped in the plastic. Da, da, da. I'm not altogether convinced we weren't somehow pushed into that how did we how did we get offered the apple in the plastic it's a, it feels a bit snow white to me you know so i think there's a little bit of push here from from producers to say well we could give you this shiny thing and that would make you feel better um susan you work in in the fashion industry it you know is consumerism a big factor here do you think massive fast fashion is is I think it's detrimental um, to our industry at the moment and, it, and it's changed um, a little bit so we already see a movement from from like crazy fast fashion to uh, more sustainable fashion in some sense but okay your, your big producer of fashion you know they they used to be just a few fashion seasons I think a summer range and a winter range. Right, yeah. you, have, you have like a monthly launch of different products. And wow. um, we know, especially, you know, the, the, the youngsters today, they want to be in fashion and they want to have the same that their friends are wearing. So they, they literally go and buy garments every day, every other second, you know, week. Um, and they wear it once and then because the friends have seen it, they, they throw it away. Um, and there's a big drive now for the reuse of recycled textiles, um, you know, textile to textile recycling, or, you know, whether it's mechanical or chemical. Um, we are also actively looking into seeing how we can bring some of these recycled textiles into the production of viscose staple fiber. Um, but we, we've seen such a clear difference between global north and global south. Um, and that includes South Africa, where I'm from. I grew up in a hand-me-down culture. So I used to get my older cousins you know, pajamas that was um, too small for them or whatever. And, and I would wear it for another season. And it might actually have been handed down to a smaller cousin once again. Um, the same happens in Indonesia. So even bed sheets and towels are sold from five star to four star, three star, until it ends up somewhere mm. in a, in a, a Airbnb or just a homestay. So a lot of the smaller villages don't have hotels. So you have someone that's got a spare room and they have a homestay. 
and the linen that they buy, they buy on open market and it's coming from a, a hotel somewhere in Jakarta or maybe Bali. Um, you know, once they reach an age on a, a sheet, they have to throw it away. Otherwise they don't meet their standards. Ah. So I see that same kind of a culture here in Indonesia where people don't just throw away good stuff. It will be reused by someone else. Shoes, denim jeans. Um, and the government actually just did something great. Maybe they were a bit too aggressive in their approach, but it, it, the, the message is good. They, they just stopped all secondhand or pre-used or pre-loved clothing from being imported into the country because now you've got all the the um, developed countries dumping all of their mm. stuff here because it's deemed to be secondhand, but half of it cannot be reused. So it ends mm. up in our landfill. Junk, yeah. In exactly, and we already don't have the infrastructure in Indonesia to properly take care of um, waste. So they've completely stopped it and they said, if you want to do thrifting, do it with local producers. Mm. So if you want to collect secondhand jeans from people who don't want it anymore, you buy from them and you can resell, but it must be local so that mm. you can support local businesses and do circular economy locally. But no more bringing in old jeans from Australia, New Zealand, or the UK and come and resell it here where you can buy something new or even from another thrift store locally. So, so, that, so coming on to that local connection then again, maybe with global consumerism, we've lost touch with that the, the, the local angle and, and uh, Cavell put in the chat about clothing swaps. Clearly you can't do that internationally. That's something that has to be done locally. But what I'm finding fascinating about this conversation is we start off talking about biodiversity and then we end up talking about clothing. It's all connected, right? Because to go back Absolutely. to Jerry's point, you know, to make that clothing, we have to extract from nature. Um, one of the most fundamental things that I think dawned on me a couple of years ago was that everything we own or consume or eat has come from nature. You know, there's no magic factory. Uh, even the fossil fuels that we make plastics out of and the rest of it has all been extracted from the planet that we call home. So why we're not concerned about that is a, is a real, real bother. And I think we've got a real challenge in terms of how we communicate this. Um, Joe put an interesting point in the Q&A about um, how do we strike a balance between this messaging that's obviously uh, fairly um, you know, complex and not getting overwhelmed um, because we're starting to hear about climate anxiety. Is the next thing gonna be biodiversity anxiety? How do we not get overwhelmed? I don't know if either of you got a quick thought on that. I don't know. I think um, businesses, governments, they're quick to make the individuals feel guilty and all. But actually, it's, it's got to come from top level, you know. And um, uh, what we all care passionately about this or we wouldn't be here today, everyone who's come along. Um, we all make sacrifices in our life. We've turned things on their head. We've changed our diets, our lifestyles. I've learned over the last couple of years to get out and enjoy life too. But you do it with a conscience. You know, you're not going to. It's the people who maybe have their head buried in the sand or just won't face up to it. That's the issue. So I think we can lead from the front, lead by example, and show that by being climate conscious, by being climate aware, you can still have a good lifestyle. It doesn't mean we all have to sit at home forever and not have any quality of life. There's lots of fun stuff you can still do. Mm. You can celebrate life, lead from the front, embody the change that you want to see and people will lead and follow from your example. I think we can't underestimate that ripple effect, you know, just these mm. positive conversations we can have. You just don't oh, I think that's really powerful, Jerry, and comes back to this advocate role and whether businesses have gone maybe too far down the consumerism role. And I know plenty of businesses don't even interact with consumers. We're all, you know, making items for, for other industries. But ultimately, uh, you know, all of us as individuals go to work somewhere and, and make decisions on a daily basis. OK, so that empowerment piece, I think, is is so, remember, so uh, important. I, I chatted to a lady a few years ago. She was involved in a big bat project with me and she had just retired but came back to help out. And she was beaten down by her whole career was dedicated to wildlife and still we're seeing massive declines. And she kind of said, I've, I've just given up now, just enjoy them. Well. Mm. 
And I found it really hard to align myself with that because, yes, they're under huge pressure, most species, but there's an awful lot of powerful and positive things happening too. There's a lot of innovation out there. Rewilding projects are taken, you know. So I think it's important to, again, connect with like-minded people and celebrate those small wins, do what we can. We can't just sit back and give up. I just think that's- No, good. And I, and I, and I, I like that. And I, and I feel the same about climate change. I feel very much that um, business and industry uh, is powerful enough to have got us to this point. You know, we've created our own future. Um, I'm, you know, there's a lot of uh, clever and powerful people working around the world. Um, I'm very confident that using some of that innovation and knowledge in the right way um, can, you know, maybe not reverse what we've done, but at least, you know, mitigate the impacts. I'm going to come on to a question from Alex, actually. Um, and that's about companies using metrics, because I think companies do like to measure stuff. Um, have you noticed an increase in companies starting to use biodiversity metrics to assess the impact of biodiversity on their activities? Um, is this something that's catching on? Is this going to help? I think so. A lot of companies now have they're looking for B Corps accreditation and my company has just just got it. And what got us the final uh, checkpoints for that was all our our land management and our uh, okay. weekly kind of biodiversity bio blitzes you know our, our wildlife records so again the the top management are seeing oh the benefits of this if we hadn't have done all this wildlife monitoring we wouldn't have our accreditation so yeah metrics are important and obviously yeah carbon output and all that is huge too mm. i think just the uh, senior management need to be aware that like plant and animal biodiversity is a serious climate solution studies have proven that where ecosystems are more intact much more carbon is naturally uh stored in the soil and you know so mm. you can, you can so, celebrate those small wins you know rewild the land around our companies as best we can. so those metrics although they might be company specific might be enough to tip us over from just thinking oh no this is hopeless to actually well we've got a rewilding target or we've got a biodiversity metric that we need to to need to act on uh, Susan, is there something you're seeing, an increase in the use of biodiversity metrics? Yeah, nature-based solutions is kind of a hot topic at the moment. Okay. Um, so I think a lot of companies are now bringing it into, uh, especially the ones that's reporting on ESG. Um, there's a, a big ask now, I think, from, from the financial sector to corporate companies to start looking into it, which I think is good, but I, I think it's better if they, they start looking at it from from within because they want to not because they've been mm. forced to i think there'll be more value added if it's something they want to do um and i think it's sometimes difficult for people to know how you can make that difference mm. we we are in that same situation we are just a manufacturing facility we don't own any land so i cannot say oh we will go and conserve this and that you always need to make sure that whatever you didn't do makes sense for your business as well for us to go and say we do this or that might not be applicable or appropriate you don't want to end up in a situation where you just throw money at something and say oh there's some money but you need to measure the value that you're adding mm. you make sure if you're going to do something it needs to be a long-term fixed value adding activity it's not just a quick fix that won't help you need to really focus on on um and identifying how you can make a long-term change and that's something that we are looking in now. I, you know, I'm looking at how us as a manufacturer can contribute positively um, to wildlife restoration or conservation within Indonesia, because this is where we operate. So we, whatever impact we, we want to make, we want to do it here. But how do you link that to your actual core business? And I think that's what a lot of companies are struggling with. Um, there's mm -hmm. no point in us operating in Indonesia doing something in Africa because we need to be able to bring the context of conservation and protection in local context. I think that we've already brought up the whole local aspect, but I think that's key, consume local, um, change behavior, use local seasonal. Um, why, want, why, do you, why do we wanna eat fruit that's not in season in our country? Why do we, we wanna import something from another continent just because we want it? Um, that's wasteful. 
Mm. So, and There's some fundamentals here, aren't there? Some big fundamentals that are affecting yeah, yeah. biodiversity, that are affecting waste, that are affecting climate. So, you know, it's a really big topic. So for me, it boils down to, you know, how we choose to live. Um, it, so it starts with mm. each of us. Each of us need to make conscious decisions to make better choices. We cannot say, oh, the people must do it. We are the people. We are. So people, each, yeah. each of us need to do it. And, we, yeah, you know, Jerry said it. We need to lead by example. We influence our immediate circle, whether it's our family and our friends. And then we hope that they will again influence their circle. Um, not all of mm. us can stand on a stage and influence millions of people um, at, you know, once just by saying something or promoting something. But I don't think we need that. We just need us, the people that's joining this webinar, to each make a decision to make a better decision. Yeah, Jerry mentioned the ripple effect, which I think is, is I'm seeing in businesses, and it's really hard for the one person, maybe the sustainability person or even the green team. But once you maybe get someone in to do a lunchtime talk or some training, and then suddenly there's two or three people in each meeting who understand it and get it or are feeling more connected, you start to see things happen so i think for me it's about momentum um because we know you know maybe we we know this is happening but we're sort of ignoring it because we don't feel enough people are feel the same as us um and so we need you know sort of that momentum so i just want to wrap up now we've got a few minutes really just two things one is what opportunities do you see you know for for business in this area we look at biodiversity it's all very bleak it's all crisis What's, Susan, what's the opportunity for business, do you think? I think every challenge is an opportunity. So I think we need to change our mindset, number one. So we right. might see this big mountain of waste in front of us and we don't know how to, to deal with it. And, you know, I am from South Africa. So in Africa, we always ask the question, how would you eat an elephant? And it's, you know, <laughs> piece by piece or bit by bit. Um, so we won't change the whole waste um, you know, infrastructure or the whole waste um, challenge all in once. But if we start making small changes as an individual or as an organization, and, we, and, we, and we, we have to talk about it because if we find a solution, why keep it to yourself so that you can write about it in your sustainability report and maybe, you know, score a little bit of uh, a limelight because you, you, have, you have reduced your waste to landfill. Tell people how you did it so they can replicate it. Um, mm -hmm. Stop keeping all of these secrets to yourself, especially if it's for the greater good. Um, so sharing, yeah. yeah, sharing your learning. Knowledge, knowledge sharing is, is, is mm -hmm. absolutely what we need to do. Yeah, great. And Jerry, what do you think the biggest opportunity for businesses around bio biodiversity? Yeah, I think a lot of businesses could be real trailblazers on this, you know, and just really promote wildlife friendly initiatives or do their own kind of driver for local biodiversity projects in and around wherever their company is located. I would hope with time, you know, it'll be the norm to do the right thing. You think back, I'm showing my age a bit here. I remember my first flights, uh, the people were still smoking on aeroplanes. Whereas nowadays you just think, oh my goodness, that seems so weird that people would smoke on an aeroplane, but it's just not considered normal anymore. And it's the same with you were saying you're you're almost the odd one out if you're bringing up that oh what about sustainability what about this hopefully that the more norm will be everyone will be on that same wavelength and if you're not on that wavelength you're you're the odd one out but I think there's enormous uh Susan said where, where there's obstacles there's opportunity I think this is a chance for people to be um dynamic versatile um innovative you know get out there and just see what we can do there's huge innovation um across mm. businesses globally and it's just working with wildlife and yeah b being a trendsetter I guess is the mm. key to I really like that idea and I think uh, what I find with businesses it, uh, 10 years ago it was very difficult to talk about climate change you know you would, you would literally be laughed out of a meeting room or told to you know oh you tree hugger or whatever mm. Um, or at least they'd say, oh, you're, you're very passionate about it, you know, sort of in a patronising way. Now they all want to talk about it. And it's a panic. And so I'm hoping that biodiversity very quickly becomes as high an agenda on the agenda as, as climate change has done in the last five years. I think, you know, there is um, 
so much emphasis on climate now. We have to remember that the two things are completely intertwined. We can't solve one without the other. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think you're right about trailblazing. I think make it a positive thing as opposed to a burden, um, you know, should excite people as opposed to make them miserable. Um, so yeah, get them out, out in the uh, forest. We can't be ostriches, you know, and put your head no. in the Well, we're doing a good job of that, I think. Um, so just quickly then, in the last couple of seconds, what, what would the main priority for you be? Susan, after this hour, what's the big action do you think we should be asking businesses to take? I think we need to change our mindset. Um, just stop thinking that recycling and reuse is the answer. It's not. Um, we should stop producing the waste. That, that, that I think is what we should focus on because once it's produced, to reform it takes energy, to reuse it takes energy. We, we should stop producing it. And I think that would change the whole landscape uh, altogether. Thanks, Susan, great. So starting, uh, changing our mindset, reduce, refuse, as uh, Mamta's just said, the first R. Uh, Jerry, what's your big priority for business? Uh, very similar to Susan, yeah, reduce the amount of waste we're producing in the first place. Um, uh, more focus on maybe nature connection and well-being mm. workplace, if possible. Thank you both. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. I told you it would go quick. That's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. That's been great. The way I'm going to summarise it, I think, is advocates invite wildlife advocates into your workplace. I'm actually arranging a biodiversity talk for somebody in May. So, uh, so you know, May's a good month. We have no mow May in, in the UK, so you don't mow your lawn in May. Get that connection to nature. Be brave, take people out on a walk at lunchtime. Love the feel good, good hormones. Uh, you know, we need more of that as opposed to what we're trying to replace in our lives all the time by buying stuff. Um, and Susan, your point about sharing, I think you're absolutely right. There is a lot of knowledge. There is a lot of stuff going on, but we're not very good at sharing it. And why, you know, we need to break that uh, tradition, I think, with keeping things to ourselves. Um, so thank you all. Uh, great discussion. Um, and thanks to everybody who stayed on towards the end. Akanksha, do you want to wrap up? Thank you. Thank you, Aman. As, as you rightly said, we need such discussions. We need such dialogues and diversity. And that's the purpose of... Uh, be waste wise to have you all here thank you so much for taking time out today and sharing your knowledge and experience i know even a day would be less for having this discussion going on and on and i would like to thank all the attendees for participating and having this conversation even more interesting and as i mentioned this webinar is going to be recorded and will be available for everybody to see through later on on our youtube channel and on our website and uh, thank you all until then let's waste thanks twice. everyone Thank you, Emma. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.